Good evening, everybody. Thank you for logging in to listen to this talk today. We'll be talking about hip and knee arthritis. But first, I want to take a couple minutes to talk briefly to you about myself. So I was originally, I'm originally from Phoenix, Arizona. I did all of my training in the Midwest. I did my undergraduate training at the University of Michigan, uh, studied mechanical engineering. I actually worked as a mechanical engineer for a couple of years before going back to school. I did medical school at Chicago Medical School. After that, I completed my orthopedic surgery residency in Michigan at Beaumont Hospital. And then I did further fellowship training specializing in hip and knee replacements at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And now I'm here. Along the way, we, we had kids uh, pretty much at every location of my training. I, I have four young children at home. They were born in Chicago, Michigan, and Minnesota. So without further ado, let's get started talking about hip and knee arthritis. So what, what is knee arthritis? It's the loss of cartilage from the end of the thigh bone or the femur and the leg bone or the tibia. This cartilage is required to provide a smooth surface for the knee to glide. If it's gone, it becomes painful. What is the epidemiology of knee arthritis? It affects around 4% of all people. 10% of these are males. 10% of males over the age of 80 are affected. And 18% of females over the age of 60 are affected. Knee disease is more common than hip disease. In fact, it's about two times more common. The main symptom of osteoarthritis is pain. That's the most common presenting symptom. There can also be stiffness, swelling, decreased motion, and really it can start to interfere with your daily activities such as walking or dressing. And it can even disrupt your sleep, which can be difficult. When I examine you in the office, some of the things that I see is swelling about the knee, limited motion or contractures, which basically means you're unable to fully straighten your knee or fully bend your knee. You may walk with a limp, use a cane or a walker or some other assistive device. You may have a deformity in your hip or knee. When looking at x-rays, this is the best way to evaluate arthritis. And these are just simple, plain x-rays. It's important that these x-rays are done standing so that we can simulate the weight-bearing view of your knee joints. It's a, you, you get a front view or an AP, a lateral view or a side view. And a great view is a, what's called a PA flexion view. Basically, this is a, a view where your knees are flexed, and this gives the best weight-bearing view of your knees. So what will x-rays show? X-rays will show joint space narrowing, as you can see here on the inside part of the knee. It can show osteophytes, or another name for osteophytes are bone spurs. You can see changes in alignment where you become bow-legged or knock-kneed. You can get further scans such as MRIs, CT scans, or bone scans, but really for arthritis, these don't provide a lot of additional information. The progression of arthritis is demonstrated here in these three pictures. The one on the left demonstrates mild arthritis. You can notice some mild joint space narrowing. But the joint space is a blackened surface in between the two white bones. And that represents a cartilage, which doesn't show, show up on x-ray. Moderate is the middle x-ray. You can see further progression of loss of that black space in between the knee joint. And severe, you start to see some deformity and changes in the bone. So what treatment options are there? There are non-surgical and surgical options. Weight loss can be a big factor. You put two to five times your body weight through your hips and your knees when you walk. So even a little bit of weight loss can go a long way. Exercise, low impact exercise specifically. Physical therapy can help some people. Walking aids such as a cane or a walker. Injections. If you're talking about surgery, there's really two main surgical options depending on the types of arthritis that you have. A unicompartmental knee replacement, which is a partial knee replacement, or a total knee replacement, which is a full knee replacement. If you're starting to become symptomatic from knee arthritis, you should avoid high-impact activities which can aggravate these symptoms. Swimming, biking, elliptical are some things that can be a low impact and that can be comfortable and allow you to continue to be active. Looking at what analgesics or pain medications are useful for treating hip and knee arthritis, Tylenol has been shown to be more effective than placebo in knees, specifically with improvement in rest pain. What about anti-inflammatories? These are things like Aleve, Motrin, Ibuprofen, things like that. They have been found to be effective in reducing short-term pain. 
And really, between the different types of, of what well, these are called NSAIDs or non steroidal anti inflammatories, there hasn't been a significant difference between the different types, but there are some differences in potential toxicity between them. What about glucosamine or chondroitin sulfate, or some people refer to this as a lubricant for your joints? This is not regulated by the FDA. It can be expensive. It could have unknown side effects, although some studies have shown some effect. What about injections? Cortisone injections or steroid injections may provide some temporary relief. They can, they, the purpose is to decrease inflammation. There is this very small potential of, of accelerating cartilage damage, a very small risk of inf infection, and many patients note some improvement. This can last for days for some people, weeks, or even months. What about a hyaluronic acid injection? These are things like lubricating type injections. This is considered a medical device. It works best for less severe arthritis. And typically, this is a series of three to five injections. There, similarly to any other injection, such as a steroid injection, there is a small risk of infection, an allergic reaction, and two-thirds of patients note some mild improvement with these injections. So what's, what's the takeaway of injections? Injections aren't a cure, but they can help treat your symptoms. What are some common questions that people have? Is surgery for me? How do I know when the right time is? When should I have the surgery? Will it work? What type of surgery should I have? And what are the best implants to use? These are all individualized for every individual patient. Operative options in the knee include arthroscopy, partial replacements, or total knee replacements. Arthroscopy in, in knees that have already developed arthritis is not useful. In fact, some literature has shown that it's no better than sham surgery in the setting of severe or moderate arthritis. What about partial knee replacements? This is indicated for people that have arthritis in just one of the three compartments of the knee. Most commonly, this is in the inside part of the knee. It can be used in either young or old patients. Your ligament should be intact for this. You should have no systemic disease, and you should be, have a weight of less than 200 pounds. What are the advantages of a partial knee replacement versus a total knee replacement? Well, you're retaining more of your native structures, so your kinematics are better. Your range of motion can be better. Gait studies have shown better function. And pain relief is just as good, if not better, than a total knee replacement. Because it's a less invasive operation, complications are less frequent and less severe, and the recovery is often more rapid. Everything is not without its disadvantages. What are disadvantages of partial knee replacements? The remainder of the knee that hasn't been resurfaced or changed into a knee replacement may have progression of arthritis. You can still tear the meniscus on the other side, and it might not last as long as a full knee replacement. What about full or total knee replacement? This has revolutionized the treatment of osteoarthritis. It can relieve pain and restore function, and it has a proven track record of restoring long -term, with long-term durability, with greater than 90% survival at 20 years. However, it requires appropriate patient selection in order to ensure these results are successful. Non-operative measures that I've already talked about should be used first. Typically, this should be used for patients with arthritis in all three compartments, the inside of the knee, the outside of the knee, and underneath the kneecap. And your symptoms from your arthritis should be limiting your overall function. So if all three of these things are in effect, you could be a candidate for a knee replacement. These figures here basically show a simple schematic of how a knee replacement is performed. Basically, you make bone cuts on the end of the femur bone or the thigh bone and a cut on the end of the shin bone or the tibia bone. And sometimes you also make a cut on the end of the kneecap or the patella and put a component on there as well. Although, if, you can, if I can preserve your, your native kneecap, I will try to do that. Some people think that a knee replacement involves cutting off the end of your bone. Well, in some degrees it does, but it's really just small slivers of bone about 9 to 10 cent millimeters or so, just enough to, to account for the size of the component that you're putting in. 
Again, I talked about the, the button that goes on the kneecap. If needed, that will be done, but I try to preserve your kneecap if at all possible. So the final knee replacement is all three or two of the three compartments resurfaced, and all implants typically are cemented, although there are some newer uncemented options that are becoming more frequently used. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about hip arthritis. Similarly to knee arthritis, it's also the loss of cartilage. In this case, it's between the top of the thigh bone or the ball and the socket, which is what the fancy term for that is the acetabulum. With loss of the smooth articulating surface, the surface becomes bumpy and can become painful. Similarly to knee arthritis, the primary presenting symptom is pain. This can be groin pain, this can be thigh pain, hip buttock pain, or lateral thigh pain. And this can be confused with other factors. You know, you, you can have a bursitis on the outside of the hip. You can have lower back symptoms. So it's important to distinguish that your symptoms are coming specifically from your hip and not from somewhere else, because many people can have pain coming from multiple sources. You evaluate this with x-rays similar to knee arthritis. Again, plain x-rays are the best. They show narrowing of the joint space, osteophyte or bone spurs, and also what's called sclerosis or a whitening or thickening of the bone. Treatment options, again, always start with non-surgical options, including weight loss, exercise, physical therapy, walking aids to offload the hip, and inject, potentially injections. The primary surgical option here is a total hip replacement. You should avoid high impact activities that aggravate your pain in your hip. Again, recommend low impact activities and weight loss if at all possible. Medications used are similar to the knee. They provide temporary pain relief. The efficacy is similar across medications and are typically done with NSAIDs or anti-inflammatories and Tylenol. There really isn't a place for narcotics in treating hip or knee arthritis. The difference with injections is, comes in, in between hips and knees in, in that injections in the hip are less, less common. Part of the reason is potentially there's less of a joint space in the hip, so there's less room for the medication to be, a, be in that area and provide a positive effect. However, it can help in diagnosis, specifically in those situations where it's unclear if the pain is coming from your back, if it's coming from your hip or somewhere else, or what percentage of pain is coming from your hip. It, its purpose is, as, a, as a steroid is to decrease inflammation and again, there is a small risk of infection with this as well. Surgical options for hip arthritis are really one, but there's two other options I'm going to talk about. There's hip arthroscopy, hip resurfacing, and a total hip replacement. The most common ways of approaching the hip are through a posterior approach or a direct anterior approach. With arthroscopy, the results are not very predictable and are used commonly for mechanical symptoms in patients with very little arthritis. It's very rarely performed in patients with underlying arthritis since the results are not very predictable. What about hip resurfacing? This, this is not very commonly done these days. The pros of this procedure is that it's bone conserving. It has a potentially decreased risk of dislocation, a potentially lower wear rate of the components. The cons of this, this type of procedure are it requires a larger incision. It's a metal-on-metal -metal articulation, so it can result in metal-on-metal -metal problems and potentially create pseudotumors. And there's an increased risk of femoral fractures. Now, what, is, what about total hip replacements and how does that work? The femoral head, which is arthritic, is removed. The acetabulum, or the cup, is prepared with with a reamer, which is like a cheese grater, to remove the re remaining cartilage and get the appropriate size and component. And this is, this is placed with, without cement, sometimes with screws. The femur is then prepared with this instrument you see in the bottom right corner, which is called a brooch, starting with a small size and in increasing in sizes to open up and size the femur appropriately. Most commonly, this is done without cement, but also can be performed in cement in certain situations. This next x-ray here demonstrates a 
x-ray of a hip that has had a hip replacement put in. And just so you can see what, what that will look like, that's a, a picture of a hip itself that's, that's overlaying the x-ray. So what about the two most common surgical approaches that I talked about? The posterior approach and the direct anterior approach. In the United States, the most common approach that's performed is the posterior approach. The next most common is the direct anterior approach. The pros of a posterior approach is a decreased risk of fracture, a potentially easier revision surgery as, you can more, as more commonly revision surgeries are done through a posterior approach, and a potentially slow, the cons, however, a potentially slow recovery in the first couple weeks, although at three months, studies have shown no difference in outcomes at three months or, or later. What about the direct anterior approach? The pros of this approach is that it has a potentially lower dislocation rate and a potentially quicker recovery time early in the first couple weeks, and it, but it comes at a risk of an increased risk of fracture. So how do you decide when to have surgery? This is an individual decision. You need to ask yourself, how much is it affecting you? Are you able to participate in post-operative recovery or sometimes physical therapy? Are you able to take six weeks off of work? And what are your expectations after the surgery? The post-operative recovery includes being seen by physical therapy the same day, multimodal pain management, basically approaching your pain with a variety of different pain medications, full weight bearing right away, and typically, either aspirin or Lovenox help prevent blood clots for four to six weeks. Your hospital stay is fairly short. Some people go home the same day, or commonly as well, people stay one night and leave the next day. Physical therapy is done for, for typically all knees and, and hips that, that need it, or sometimes every hip gets it as well. Like I said, aspirin and Lovenox, which is an anticoagulant or a blood clot preventer, is used for four to six weeks. And if physical therapy is needed, it's typically done initially for two or, three, two or three times a week. So what can you expect for your recovery? I like to break this down into, into threes, three days, three weeks, three months. In the first three days, you start to get around fairly well around the house. In the first three weeks, you start to get around fairly well around town. And at three months, you're kind of back fully to doing the, your normal activities. Although you continue to make recovery and improvements for up to a year. So what are long-term expectations after a joint replacement? You can resume most activities. For hips, you should avoid positions of risk for dislocation. Initially, there is a yearly follow-up and longer thereafter. And hips and knees on average last 15 to 20 years or even longer. So in conclusion, joint replacement is very successful. It can reliably relieve pain and improve function. But you should be aware of direct to consumer marketing. Ask your surgeon questions. Remember, newer is not always better. Thank you for listening. That's the end of this talk, and I'm happy to take questions uh, at this point. All right, we do have two. Um, how long does a typical knee replacement last? That's a good question. So typically uh, at 20 years, there's high 80s percent to even up to 90 percent uh, survivorship of knee replacements at that duration. So the goal is, if you get a knee replacement, the goal is that this knee replacement is one that will last you the rest of your life. You never know. So every, every procedure is not without its complications. Some of these main complications are in infection, fracture, dislocation, components loosening up over time. If none of those things happen to you, then you, know, you have a very good chance that this will last you a very long time. Those risks are all very low in single percentage points, but they're not zero. And so they're very real risks. And if obviously, if one of them happened to you, it would be a big deal. Fortunately, the risks of those are quite low. Um, if you use the elliptical more than 30 minutes, am I damaging or wearing out my knee faster? Sometimes I worry about doing too much. 
That's, that's a good question. Really, the, the, the activities that you should do or not do if you're having pain are contingent upon the, the discomfort of the pain you're having. You're not necessarily going to, you're not going to wear out your joints more quickly by doing more activity. However, it can be more uncomfortable and it can make it harder to get around if you already have significant arthritis. So I would say just use your knee symptoms as your guide for that. There's nothing that you can do to your knees by continuing to exercise that will significantly change your op what an operation would look like at the time you would potentially get a knee replacement. Do you need to avoid potential dislocation positions forever or it improves with time? So typically, it's the, the, the highest risk time is early on, the first few months after surgery as your soft tissues are healing. Typically, once those soft tissues are healed, the dislocation risk becomes much, much lower. So in general, you know, you can go about your daily activities and not really worry too much about what positions you, you do. There's a couple of key positions depending on the approach that you should avoid. But in, in general, these, these implants are, are very stable. Does walking help keep bone strong? Walking, walking is, is, a, is a good activity that pretty much anybody can do. Just getting out, walking, moving around, it's a very basic activity that will that is that was good for your health and is, is is definitely encouraged before and even after you would have a joint replacement. So I would say, I don't know specifically about your bone health. I don't think there's a direct correlation with that, but it's definitely a good activity to do. What about entry from the side? No muscle cutting. I, I'm not. I'm not sure what exactly you mean by uh, entry from the side or, or no muscle cutting. There are different um, ways to approach hip and knee replacements. For hip replacements, the two most common that I, I talked about are the posterior approach and the direct anterior approach. In terms of outcomes between those. The best study of, for that is actually out of, out of the Mayo Clinic, where I trained for my hip and knee replacement fellowship. They completely randomized patients between getting a direct anterior approach and getting a posterior approach. And as you can imagine, there's great surgeons out there at the Mayo Clinic. And what they found was no difference in outcomes after three months. There was some mild early improvements at around two weeks for the direct anterior patients. These were slightly more steps that were done by those patients getting off of a cane or a walker a few days to a week earlier, that sort of thing. So early on, there's some very mild improvements, which, which could make a difference for you. But long term, there is no difference. The key with any operation is an operation that is done well, and it doesn't necessarily matter which approach it's done through. What are your thoughts on stem cell therapy as an alternative for hip replacement? So, I think stem cell therapy at this point is not proven. They're, they're looking at various studies all across the country and across the world at stem cells for a variety of things, including arthritis. Nothing conclusive has come out from those at this point, and it's very expensive. So I think in general, if you're pursuing stem cells for significant arthritis, honestly, I, th I think it's, it's a waste of your, of your time and your money. Again, it's, any activity is, is, is safe as long as it's something you're comfortable with. You know, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like with anything, as you get later in life, if it's something you've done for a while, you're going to be good at it, and you should do it if you enjoy it and you can tolerate it. Picking up skiing if you've never done it before, just like picking up any other sport if you've never done it before, it, it, can, be, it can be dangerous, not for your arthritis, just for your uh, injury, uh, injury sake. Is that, there permanent synthetic cartilage injections on the horizon? That is something I'm not very familiar with. Okay. Are knee replacements very painful? So knee replacements are initially more painful than hip replacements. In fact, hip replacements of all surgeries, not just orthopedic surgeries, has been rated as a, that associated with the second highest patient satisfaction. The number one surgery that high, has the highest patient satisfaction is cataract surgery. And as you can imagine, 
you can't see, and now you can see, oh, that would be very rewarding. Hips are too. Th knees are very rewarding as well, but there's a, typically a higher rehabilitation period associated with it. A lot of times in the first few weeks after surgery, patients are possibly angry with their surgeon, saying, you know, why did I go through this? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm recovering and it's painful. But you go through the rehab and you work on getting your knee range of motion back. The results are very good. And so it's definitely, as compared to hips, a higher um, or a longer recovery period. But uh, you should be happy with the result at the end. What about overall inflammation, like ankylosing spondylitis? It impedes non-surgical treatment, i.e., I get worse pain stiffness even after non-impact exercise like swimming. Is it counterproductive? So that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. In terms of, I'll answer your question in terms of the non-operative thing with ankylosing spondylitis. That's a tough problem. You know, it can be associated with a lot of stiffness, a lot of pain. So I, I, can, I can hear where, where you're coming from. The key with trying to get through with your daily activities before requiring a joint replacement is three things. Typically, one of, the, one of those is activity modification. What does that mean? You continually modify your activities. You avoid, start to avoid those things which cause pain and cause symptoms. And eventually, those, those limitations of your activity are significant enough that you no longer want to keep cutting back your activities to avoid the pain. And that's the time to consider a joint replacement. If you can avoid activity and still be happy with your daily function, then I would say keep going with that. But uh, it, it's definitely a tough situation that you're in. I, I, I hear you. What do you think of hyaluronic supplements over the counter? So those those are not those are not uh, regulated. Um, Many studies have shown no effect. A few studies have shown some improvement, and it can be expensive. So if, if people are on it and they ask me about it and they want to try it, you know, and you're willing to spend the money for it, I'd say try it. If it works for you, give it, give it a month or two to try it. If it works for you, keep going with it. If it doesn't work, then there's no point to continue and you might as well stop. Is wearing an elastic band on your knee helpful? So it can be. Again, if you look at the data, uh, it's not, you know, reliably helpful. But some, some people say it makes a difference. And so that's similar to the hyaluronic. You know, if, if, it, if the elastic sleeve or brace allows you to get around better, then I would say use it. But in terms of looking at a big group of people, does it make overall make a big effect? Probably not. Some of the other things that have been tried are something called an offloader brace, which is if you have a Arthritis primarily of your one one joint in your knee, one compartment in your knee, which is typically the inside. It, it tries to align your knee so that it opens up that space, and that's kind of an unpredictable thing as well. Okay. The last question is the same. The hyaluronic injections work bone on bone, but I think you already answered. So, I, so just kind of in conclusion here, you know, when when is when is the right time to consider a hip or a knee replacement? You should ask yourself this question. Is your pain level, quality of life, and activity limitations affected significantly enough that you want to undergo an operation? If you ask yourself that question and the answer is yes, that's the time to have it done. It doesn't matter what your arthritis looks like on x-rays. If you ask that question and you have bad arthritis and the answer is no to that question, you're not ready for a joint replacement. But if you have the arthritis on radiographs and the answer to that question is yes, that's the right time. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for listening today.